He said in verse 3, there was a mortal wound, a deadly wound, and his deadly wound was healed. And so today, uh, I want to talk to you um, about the wounds that can come in our life, you know. So he's equating us with the beast. Wow. When the deadly wound, <laughs> wound was healed, then there's those people like me that don't have a clue what this verse means. I mean, what's the purpose of having the Bible at all? Right. We don't need this. No, it's just a prop. So he starts with the beast. And the pattern that was established by the beast is the same pattern that Jesus used. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth. I am. I know I am. You believe me, don't you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Hit, Hit the, the Bar. Bar. I'm Steve Kozar. I'm Paulette Kozar. And we've got Lucy Kozar. Lucy Kozar. What do you think about that intro? Is that a good enough intro? I think so. We were, we were a little overly dramatic. We're getting Aren't more. we always? <laughs> so this is going to be the best program ever. ever. Actually, I don't know about that for sure. What do you think, Luce? What do you think? So she's been on her medicine for a while. And if you notice, her sweaters are looking bigger. It's because she's losing weight, which she, she needs to do. She lost a lot of weight. She's. We found out she's got diabetes, for yeah. those of you who haven't seen her videos. So it's like having a baby. We have to give her insulin at 6 in the morning and yep. 6 at night. But it's all good. She's hey, but shout out to all of our campuses That's all right. over the world. You guys are awesome. Hey, it's been a while since we've seen you. We're so excited you're here. We're so excited about what God's doing in all of our lives all over the world at all of our campuses. I'm glad I'm sitting this far away. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking. Oh, I was going to look him up. Darn. He has an unusual spelling. Gen. It almost looks like Genta Zen, frankly. Yeah. But it's always just pronounced Jensen. Okay. Jensen. So you can look him up or are you going to... Hey, let's look him up, shall we? Keep talking Here's about a handy man. tip, everybody. So where is he from? He's from Georgia. At least his church is. I don't know if that's where okay. he grew up, but he's from the south somewhere because you can hear it in his voice. And here's a handy tip for all of you who are wondering, hey, what do you think about Pastor So-and-so? Is he a that's good a pastor? Good mm -hmm. Hey, what do you... What do you guys, can you guys do a video? No, we, we actually can't do a video on everybody. That's crazy. And a lot of people are not that well known. So... There isn't that much information on them. What we're hoping to do is to point out the obvious issues between the mega pastor and scripture because a lot of these smaller churches follow some mega pastor. Exactly. They're and all so, doing the same sort of thing. Right. So you see some pattern. So number one, uh, if it's a small pastor, there's a really good chance that there isn't any information about him. But whoever he references, and they do reference mm -hmm. their favorite people, they quote their favorite people, just look at their favorite people. Right. And if their favorite person is this guy, well, you already know that you need to find a new church. <laughs> Actually, you don't know that yet if you haven't seen where we're going with this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to see if there's a Wikipedia thing. I don't know if they'll have one or not. I just want some bio stuff, you know. Here we go. Okay. He's an American evangelical pastor, author, and tele-evangelist. Okay. Which kind of doesn't mean <laughs> Anything a whole lot. Anything anymore. Right? Yeah, but it generally means that they're on TV. Which now is YouTube. Yeah, and it also means that they're usually asking for money more often than not. But Okay, keep it going. He is the senior pastor of Free Chapel, the multi-site church with campuses <laughs> in Gainesville, Georgia, and author of Right People, Right Place, Right Plan, Fasting, Fear, Fighters, and the Spirit of Python. No, really? Yeah, he did one about Python a long time ago. He's in that Python video I did. Okay. Uh, personal life, published works, references. Wow. Nothing... Where he went to school, yeah. or his theology major, or obviously major in theology, but like which school that he did that with. On his way to a musical career as a saxophone player, he became an, an evangelist. Wow. After Roy, uh, Roy Wellborn, senior pastor of the Free Chapel, died in 1989, Franklin was installed as pastor of Free Chapel. So he went from <laughs> playing the saxophone, <laughs> senior pastor dies. Boom! There you go. No, I, that's not the exact story, but that's. But all. we don't know what the story is. We don't know exactly. Right. One of the things that's just super important is that a, a pastor really does need to be qualified. They need to be trained. This is biblical. This is in the New Testament. This is not something that was developed, you know, after Constantine or one of these cliches that you always hear. It's really important for a pastor to be trained in the scriptures. And it's interesting. Our pastor always says, you know, would I want a dentist working on me that never went to dentist school? You know, but read a couple of articles. You know, yeah. would I want to go to a heart surgeon 
And I don't. I instead go to a man who focuses on a foot. You know, the guy that works out of the back of his van. Right. He's good enough. And we, we neglect to look at the importance of that in our spiritual life, and yet that's actually eternity we're looking at. So they are supposed to be shepherding us here on earth, preparing us for eternity and getting through um, our life on earth. So when you all wonder, you know, what about school? Why is, you know, going to seminary or why is education important? One of the, one of the misunderstandings is that Jesus and the disciples weren't trained. Okay. Well, I don't know if anybody says that about Jesus, but they say that about the disciples right. because the disciples were plucked out of obscurity. But they spent three years with Jesus, who was constantly teaching them. Who was the Son of God. Right. So he was kind of familiar with scriptures, and right. I think he had a lot of stuff memorized. I think right. he, uh, he was probably a really good teacher. <laughs> really good teacher. And the apostles went and taught. They preached and taught. They and taught a lot. That's what their entire life was all about. It was, it was about the Word of God and teaching what they learned from the Master. And the apostles were special and had special anointing because they were the ones who witnessed Jesus Christ. They yeah. were the ones yep. who witnessed everything. And we can't expect that same thing to occur in modern day 2022. There are no new apostles. There you go. Yeah. Um, that's, that's another topic, really good topic, but I don't see anything about his training here. Okay, let's get, let's just get to this. Now, let's now, jump in. It's kind of like a cold ice Swimming jump pool? In. The polar we just bear, jump in. Polar bear challenge. We're going to do the plunge right here. <laughs> this is actually not a new sermon, and uh, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. When this came out, Chris Roseborough actually did a little blurb of this on what used to be the Fighting for the Faith podcast before there was a okay. Fighting for the Faith YouTube channel. And in case you don't know about that podcast and you want more teaching, there's hundreds and hundreds of episodes. And he does really, really in-depth teaching. And he shows you in great detail how these men twist the word of God. Anyway, that's a plug for Chris. There this you go. is This is something that he did a blurb on. I wrote a little article back before I was doing videos. And it just occurred to me not too long ago, oh, I wonder if that video is still out there. I, I would love to use that because it was so outrageous. It's amazing that he got away with this. Well, I find out not only is this video still on, on YouTube, yeah. I actually saved it in the hard drive because I thought, oh, they're going to remove it. They're going to take it, right. Not only has it stayed on the interwebs, it has 445,000 views since it came out in October of 2014. People like this video. Which is frightening. Yeah, hang it's on, horrifying. Hang on to your hats, folks. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can shrink it down just a little bit so I don't block. I'm kind of experimenting with how to best use the screen behind us. There we go. I think there's a little commercial in the beginning. I may skip that. The following program is sponsored by friends and partners of Kingdom Connection. At one time in our life or another, we have 13. Okay. <laughs> Photo shoot. Go to Revelation chapter 13. Go to it may you seem like do that. At first that these scriptures are confusing, but I believe that truth will come forth no. in the next few moments. No, it your won't. eyes of understanding will be open. So he's going to read it, and he's going to tell you that truth's going to come forward, right? Yeah, how, right. How did he just say that exactly? Let's listen to that again. This is so amazing. ...are confusing, but I believe that truth will come forth in the next few moments, and your eyes of understanding will be open. Uh, he talks about in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 13, I saw a beast that had seven heads and seven horns and seven crowns on his head come up out of the sea. And then in verse 3, and I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound, listen to this, was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Um, okay. So far, he's just read scripture. Yeah, so for you viewers at home, just try to guess where he's going to go next. I didn't. I couldn't. Because it was so far out there, when you had me guess, I couldn't. And when it came about, I just thought, this is ridiculous. I'm not sure if this is where he starts interpreting or not. We'll find out which he has given a mouth to speak great things and blasphemies. He speaks blasphemies. 
And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. He said in verse 3, there was a mortal wound, a deadly wound, yeah, keep, and go. his deadly wound was healed. And so today, uh, I want to talk to you um, about the wounds that can come in our life. You know, this scripture, some Bible teacher. So, so let me just get this clear. Yeah. He is, Give it, yeah, clear it up, honey. <laughs> Go ahead, clear it up. He's saying the beast has a mortal wound but got healed. And now he's saying, wait a minute, there are wounds in our life mm -hmm. that need to get healed. Mm -hmm. So he's equating us with the beast. Wow. No, thank you. You can't do a satire That's, on this. I mean, insanity. It's insanity. And commentary say that it is dealing with the Antichrist. I think certainly it is forecasting a coming world dictator, but I don't know if these seven heads, what they mean. Some say it means that he will be shot or assassinated and then come back to life. We don't know. Nobody really knows. Some other people say it is uh, one of seven nations that will, like Germany, will be wiped out but come back and to life in the end time. No one knows for sure. Then there's those people like me that don't have a clue what this verse means. Wow, and he's teaching, and he is a pastor and a shepherd over thousands of people. This is not a real church. No, it's not. I mean, by definition, the guy that's I don't saying, know. I don't have a clue what it means. I don't have means. a clue what it means. <laughs> it reminds me of Todd White saying, I don't know how to do a church. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's like, no, then you need to step down. This idea that you as a pastor... <laughs> If you're too well trained, it makes you intrinsically a bad pastor is really common. And this has been going on in American evangelical churches for about 200 years. This idea that the really good pastors, all they do is they read the Bible and they just say, God, I don't know what this means. You go ahead and just tell me and then I'll tell them. And, and if you have any training from an actual seminary, if you have any kind of denomination, any kind of structure, that means you're automatically disqualified. That's the way... A lot of people have been brought up. Right. And there are seminaries that are way too liberal and they don't teach what's biblical because <clears> they've <throat> they've actually changed what was biblical into this new kind of uh, human humanized uh, version of Christianity. And that's been going on for over 100 years. So that's a real problem for sure. This this very progressive, you know, the Bible really isn't God's word. It just is a, kind of a tool for us to make lives better and to improve ourselves. Right. That, that's obviously a problem, and that does come from bad seminaries. But that doesn't mean that seminary is intrinsically wrong and that a good quality education for a pastor is intrinsically wrong. Right. So this is a guy who just admitted he doesn't know what he's talking about. Let's see. He doesn't what, have a clue. He doesn't have a clue. Right. Excel. There must be something in it for our life because it's the inspired Word of God. Okay, so there must be something in it for our lives. He can... Because it's the inspired Word of God. Okay, yes, it is the inspired yeah, Word of God. Yeah, we believe that. And we believe that it, the inspired Word of God has things for our life. But it doesn't mean that every passage is directly related to something in our lives, <laughs> especially the one about the beast. Yeah. Getting mortally wounded. Yeah, and then, and then being healed. He is going to be talking about all of our wounds, so hang on. Yeah. Um, Keep it going. Yeah. And what I want to show you is this. The point that I see in it more than anything else is there was a wound, and it was a deadly wound. It was designed to bring forth death. It was a wound that was inflicted and it was a deadly wound mm -hmm. to bring death. Mm -hmm. And it's a picture of most people. Because <laughs> I think everyone under the sound of my voice has or will in life suffer hurt, suffer wounds, suffer disappointments, wounds that should have, could have, and will kill if they are not healed. And we could just, you know what? We could end it right here. We actually because he could. draws it out for the next how many minutes? Oh, it it's not that long, but it seems much longer. It does. It's painful. <laughs> I've got wounded by this whole sermon oh, trying yes, to heal yes. from it. <laughs> so, 
The Bible cannot mean whatever somebody wants it to mean. Right. Words mean something and the Bible means something, but the Bible doesn't mean anything that you want it to mean. It does to him. It does to him. If your pastor pre preaches this yeah. way, uh, I, I hope that our channel helps you to get the confidence to say, I'm leaving. Right. You don't have any obligation to a pastor who has no clue. And we've, <laughs> we've talked to people right. who have been intimidated for decades yes, in many cases. We have. By, and, you know, pastors who say, you know, if you're going to really show that you are a real Christian, you're going to stick it out with me here and you're not going to... You're going to be loyal. You're going to be, be loyal. a follower. And if you don't, well, you know, then the, you're, you're going against God. You're, you're following the devil. Right. No, actually, a pastor like this doesn't have any right to have any followers whatsoever. And if your pastor is anything like this, I encourage you, leave immediately. Yep. You can tell them why. You can have a discussion with them, but you don't really even have to do that. We found nine out of ten times, as a matter of fact, I don't know of one that actually worked like us. And with your, you know, details and learning and, and research wrote up, I don't know how many pages, to our former pastor, met with him, yeah. talked about it, you know, oh, that makes sense, of course, and nothing. I mean, nothing they, changed. They, they want you to leave. Right, they if want you to If you're not going to gonna follow along blindly. I've not heard of anyone who actually has made a difference. Right. And, and there's got to be exceptions. I'm sure there is, but But in general, a guy like this who admits right. he has no idea what he's talking about, and then he's going to go ahead and tell you what he thinks it means. Right. And he's a shepherd. A so-called shepherd. Right. Yeah. But I mean, his position and authority that he has taken on is a shepherd. And you know and what? People if, are looking at him for guidance. Yes. And there's two groups responsible. There's the people at the top, like him, who are incredibly guilty. Right. You know, the Bible does tell us in James, not many of you should be teachers. You will be judged more strictly if you're a teacher. Right. That applies to this clown. But the other side of the equation is all the people sitting in the chairs going, okay, I guess the beast and me are kind of the same because <laughs> I have I have wounds in I my past. I'd like to get healed, like yeah. the beast got healed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Then there's there's our you're just our you're just saying you're just saying hey I'm right. I'm just Mr. Gullible here. I I believe whatever you say because you're the guy on stage. I, I'm just I'm always fluctuating between feeling really sorry for people in a place like this and feeling no sor not sorry at all. Right. For people who are sitting there listening to this. Obviously, yeah. if you were reading your Bible. You'd notice it right away. I would think so. I would too. I don't know how you don't go. The, the beast is an example of us and how. Our we, wounded. We all have wounds in life. And it might kill us if it's not healed. Yeah, we better get our wounds healed because we don't want to get a deadly wound like the beast. <sighs> anyway. And we got to keep going. Yeah, we do. The Bible said in John 10, 10, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Okay, I want to make a video of every false teacher misquotes this passage. Every one of them. John 10, 10, can I read it? They do but it. But in context, I want to read it. Do you remember when we did this last? Because we've already done this. I mean, literally, we could do every single show on John 10, 10, because this is one of the foundational beliefs of these false teachers. And frankly, they come out of the word of faith, charismatic world. But they're in every It's about world. the good shepherd. So Jesus is talking. John uh, chapter 10, verse 10. I'm going to start at the beginning. That's a really good way to do it, honey. Yeah, in context. In so context. You, you understand the story and who he's talking with. Or two. Amen, amen, I tell you. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the door, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who centers, or enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by um, name, I bet. By name, there it is. And they follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but they will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration in speaking to the people, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Verse seven. So Jesus said again, Amen, Amen, I tell you, I am the door for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Verse 10. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. 
11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired man who is not a shepherd does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. Because he works for money, he does not care about the sheep. That's the end of verse 13. Do you want me to stop there? Yeah, that's good. Okay. I think that's good, actually. I'm not sure. Let me... Um... <clears throat> Bring it up. Bring it up. You're reading from the Evangelical Heritage Version. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I have that here. I made a comment about it, how it was similar to the old NIV, but it was more accurate. Yeah. And then I had a comment from an NIV hater who went on and on about how terrible the NIV is. Huh. And I'm like, okay, well, I didn't use the NIV. I used our version, which is more accurate than the NIV, and it replaces all those issues in the NIV that you guys have a problem with, and still you want to spout off about how much you hate the NIV. Some people really have a problem with these translations. Even yeah. when you use a good one, they still want to yell about the thing that they want everyone to know about. And they're always King James people. Always. Sorry. I love the King James. But uh, the Bible wasn't written in King James. Okay. No English Bible is perfect. <clears throat> so what do you have pulled up here? This is the same thing. Oh, yeah. It what keeps version? going. This is the same one that you were reading, the okay. Evangelical Heritage Version. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I also have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This is the commission I received from my father. So that's talking about how, you know, the, uh, the Gentiles will, will be the other sheep. Because everyone at this point in his little group in the surrounding area, they're all Jewish. They're all seeing everything through the lens of, you know, this God is really just a Jewish God. For Israel only. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the part about uh, the one that they quote, the part that they quote. 10, 10. The one that he just quoted, Jensen Franklin. 10-10. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is not about Satan. It's about false teachers who pretend to be the good teachers. Mm -hmm. Here's a really good article I found on this very topic. I will put a link to this in the video that you're watching right now. Again, I, I, I see this used in almost every sermon that I review because the point of a word of faith sermon is almost always the same. You haven't gotten what you want in life. You haven't, you know, had enough money. You haven't had success with your raising Healing. your kids. You haven't gotten healed. Mm -hmm. And that's because Satan is trying to kill and destroy. And you got to fight Satan. And I, you know, we got the secret, whatever. Formula. The formula. Mm -hmm. So they're ignoring the fact that, that that's not what this passage is about. And they're ignoring the fact that this passage is about how Jesus came to lay down his life for us right. to forgive our sins, not to make all of our dreams come true and to make sure that we're always healed and always in prosperity. And and It's that, another gospel. Right. So he clearly, I mean, Jesus, the, the basic need, the most important need we had was eternal life because we are all dying every day. We're getting older and death will come. Yeah. And... What's more important is where are we going to be for eternity, not here for the next 20 years or 30 years. And, you know, I think I at times also have a problem of always looking at what's happening today opposed to, you know, what God has done for us for eternity. And that's that that's the good news. That is the true gospel mm -hmm. of what Jesus came to teach us. And the uh, the Jensen Franklin thing, Yeah, it's just like everybody else. I'm going to give you the... the Secret, whatever. Right, formula. So, so you can... Now, he's going to talk about getting over hurts and having uh, different wounds in so, life. So right now, he quoted 1010. And now let's see what he says. Can you put him back Oops. up? Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's see what he says next. Yeah. The devil does not fight fair. <laughs> You're right. He's taken... Yeah. It's the devil. Okay. The devil will not give up until you're wounded to death. If you let him, he will wound you. He will attack you. It's problem after problem, issue after issue. I completely disagree with that. Explain why. Because the devil doesn't care about 
uh, problems per se. He cares about stealing your soul eternally. Right. His right. whole goal is to make sure you don't go to heaven. Right. His whole goal is to make you comfortable enough with your life so that you don't care about eternity. Mm -hmm. You're having too much of a good time here on earth. Mm -hmm. So he's got it completely wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, this look, is, at, look at the life of Job. Yeah, they don't they don't like that. One. You know, Job actually went through and, and the Lord allowed it. God allowed it. Um, God allows bad things to happen. And it's always for our good. And, and you know, I'm trying to remember, I just was writing it in my journal about how, you know, God does use all things for good mm -hmm. to those who are called according to his purposes. And it's true. Um, right. And Jesus even said, you know, you're going to have, you know, in this life, you mm -hmm. will have many trials. Many trials, tribulations. Yeah, just but yeah. I've overcome. And, and, when, and yeah. when he said, I've overcome, <clears throat> he wasn't saying, don't worry, I got the secret so that you right. never have problems in this life. What he <clears throat> overcame was... The, the actual real problem at the yes. end of life, which right. is, are you going to go to heaven or, or are you going to go to hell? Right. And you deserve to go to hell because of your sin. We all do. Every right. single one of us. Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins, to take our place and to suffer the consequences that we deserve. Even though he didn't deserve it, he took our sin on the cross. And, and then we, in turn, we wear his righteousness like a robe. Mm-hmm. We inherit. That, yes. We, we didn't deserve it at all. No. So that message is completely obscured and buried under this by something like this. Under this, uh, this facade. cloak of, of the beast having a mortal wound. Yes. And then taking this beautiful scripture in John 10.10 10 and making it out to be Satan. Anyway. It's pretty bad. Yes. You, the devil's intent is to deliver, listen to me carefully, a deadly wound. A deadly wound until he wounds you to death. He hits you here and then he hits you there. Deadly wounds. And if he can't get you, he'll get your spouse. And if he... We live in fear, live this in fear, live in fear. Fear mongering. Fear, fear, fear. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that's amazing, and I think it was, um, yeah, I think it was uh, um, uh, Justin Peters saying how, how, how do they, why do they keep, Binding the devil. They already did that. He sure gets unbound a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah. This preoccupation with the devil is is not healthy. It's it actually, isn't. it's pretty embarrassing. Well, I remember when we were going through the word of faith thing and my preoccupation with the devil, you know, you were finding the devil under every rock. Yeah. I mean, every time something moved, you know, or <laughs> was bad. Oh, wait, hang on. Oh, wait, that was just the, dish, the dishwasher. You it's know, okay. It wasn't the devil. <sighs> What a stress. Yeah. If he can't get your spouse, he'll come after your kids. And if he can't get your kids, then he'll hit your business. He'll hit your finances. He's some, he just keeps trying to do what he does. Again, he, he wants you to have good finances. The devil wants you to be successful so that you will ignore spiritual things. So where is his, his as he's describing all of these things of what Satan is doing, I don't see any scripture verse to back up exactly what he is presenting. You, you actually want this man to open the Bible again? <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> okay. No, he, he might. I don't remember what he does. I don't either. It's been a little while. Kill, steal, and destroy. And he tries his best to wound people. So far, he has used the Bible a couple of times. He hasn't quoted it directly very much. In mm -hmm. the beginning, he almost did, but he didn't really. He didn't Revelation, just read it. Revelation, yeah. right. And now he's... And then he, he actually highlighted the beast with his wound. Yeah. And he doesn't really know what it means. But nope. he equates it to our wounds. Yes. And then he goes into John 10.10 10, talking and about... Totally misquotes that. Yeah, and, and is saying that Satan instead of false teachers. Right. Because... Who are pretending to be the, the good shepherd. shepherd. The yeah. good shepherd, right. You read the book of Job and you see how that Satan operates. He wounded that man over and over and over and over and over. Okay, but God gave him permission to do that. Right. Do you think he's going to bring that up here? No. Trying to wound him with a deadly wound to make him curse God and give up. I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you saw a real miracle with your eyes? I want you to look to your left and... Let's... What? Okay, so <laughs> from Job, Job would have been a beautiful story to read and to explain how God is God. Well, and, and Job, really the conclusion of everything yes. is, though he slay me, yes. yet I will praise him. Right. 
God, you can kill me. That's your prerogative. You're God. Right. I deserve nothing. Everything I have Instead of, is a gift from you. If you take right. it away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. Whether I have a lot or I have nothing, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the actual point of the book of Job. Yeah, instead of, look what Satan's doing to me. You know, <laughs> Satan's trying to get you. Look Satan. what he did to poor old Job. And then, I mean, even Job in his, in his misery didn't say, wow, look what Satan's doing to me. I mean, he, he was he was not happy about it, no, for sure. But I mean, he, he wasn't... He didn't curse God. Right. He didn't get that right. Right. But he just totally missed the actual point of Job completely. Right. This is a man who is unbelievably disqualified, and he's huge. This guy has a huge church. And um, I did a video, a lot of you have probably already seen it, but I did it, uh, came out a year ago, called Celebrity Super Pastors oh, or something. Oh, right, right, right. He's one of the guys in there. And when he's not... The famous guy, he has the other young and up and coming famous guys speaking at his church or he's a guest speaker at their church. There is a small group of super pastors and they are a sort of Christian mob. They're a mafia. They really are. They are at the very, very top. They are speaking in each other's churches, endorsing one another's books, and they have no theological training in almost every case. When you say mafia and mob, you're bringing in, okay, we'll kill somebody and there's a hit on someone. No, they're, it's all about uh, protecting explain, each yeah. other. They're, the, they're at the very top and they do make a ton of money by getting speaking fees. And the reason they endorse each other and when if, if this guy goes and speaks at somebody else's church, you can, you can guarantee that the host pastor is going to say, we are so honored today. You can't believe how incredible this guy is. He's the most amazing person in the world. I decided to take some time and go on the inter the interwebs and onto YouTube, and I found a bunch of video footage where Jensen Franklin is either the guest speaker or he has the same people that were hosting him now speaking at his church. Note the way they praise each other. It's almost like they're reading a script. Note also the selling of books. We have a guy, I'm gonna introduce him to you because there may be somebody here for the first time, but honestly, he's like a part of our family. From Free Chapel Church, one of the greatest preachers alive today, not just an amazing preacher, but an amazing man with an international television ministry that touches homes all over the world and a heart for people in a powerful way. My good friend, Pastor Jensen, has written a book and I invited him to come and share on it because I believe so much in the message of this book, Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. We were uh, spent some time together in Sydney and he was telling me the story behind this book and I said, when it comes out, will you please come and share this message of hope, grace and forgiveness to my church. So many people I know we've been hurt, we've been betrayed, we've been let down, we're carrying wounds. Today is a day, by the grace of God, things will change. Could you please help me welcome our good friend, Pastor Jensen Franklin. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, God bless you. Hey. It's an absolute honor to be back at possibly the greatest church in the world. I think that what God is doing with this ministry and with your pastors, we love Pastor Craig, Pastor Amy. To come preach for him is one of the most intimidating things in the world because you just get the best every week. And I honor you and I thank God for your friendship. I'm honored to be a part of what God's doing here, a tiny part. I know that God's going to speak to you today. Today, I want to introduce to you an amazing guest speaker. This man has been a friend for a long period of time for me. I love his humility. I love his passion for the Word. This guy is a student of God's Word. This guy, this guy is a guy student, student of God's, God's Word. God. He's got an internationally known television ministry that touches homes all across the world. And then at the same time, He's got one of the most amazing student ministries, literally filling stadiums, entire stadiums full of young adults who are passionate about Jesus. You're gonna see why today as you hear him teach God's word. Could you help me show a little bit of Life Church love today for Pastor Jensen Franklin? Thank you so much. Wow, it's so wonderful to be back at Life Church with Pastor Craig and Amy. It's a delight and joy to be here with all of you at every campus, 27 campuses and counting. 
what God is doing through this ministry. You know that probably Life Church has helped more pastors than you can imagine. We don't just rip off Pastor Craig's messages and all of that. But beyond that, the whole at the movies, really, uh, wave that has hit our nation that gives pastors like me an amazing uh, month of vacation that I have never had in my life. And I want to say to Pastor Craig and to the amazing teams that put those movies together, you make us look brilliant, and we are so thankful. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for an amazing, amazing team of Life Church. We love you guys, and I'm delighted to be here. You know, you got some of the best-looking pastors too, right? I, my personal belief is it helps evangelism if your pastors are good looking like your pastors are. He's preaching tonight here at our church. It's not me, it's not me. I didn't want to spend yesterday preparing. Why would I when I got one of the best preachers in the world in town? Jensen Franklin will be bringing a different message tonight. So that's cool. And then Pastor Jensen, I, I better introduce him first, Pastor Jensen, I never take it for granted that people like Jensen Franklin come to our conference and come and stay over for a weekend in church. These, these people could be anywhere they want. Obviously, he himself got an incredibly significant church, Free Chapel, that he pastors, but his ministry's big. The demand on him is big. But he chooses not only to be at conference pretty well every second year, but also stay over for a weekend and preach to our church. So let's show him our gratitude today for who he is and for, of course, speaking across our church. All right. The most precious people, Brian and Bobby Houston and all of their family. I just, I think you're so blessed. To be under such phenomenal leadership. That inspires you every time you get around them. But today, you are in for an amazing treat. We have with us and. Boy, he just did some of the greatest preaching that you could ever hear on marriage. We're so delighted to have Chris and Tammy Hodges. Sharice and I have no one in the ministry that we look up to more than this couple. They are precious, precious people. Listen to this. He started a church in Birmingham, Alabama called the Church of the Highlands. And he basically started it in his living room and it has exploded. They run 30,000 plus every Sunday, multiple campuses all over Alabama and probably breaking out of Alabama now. God only knows where they're gonna end up. And uh, just the kindest, nicest, sweetest, humble people that preach amazing truth and live it. And I am so delighted to have for the first time on a Sunday, Pastor Chris Hodges. He's been kind enough to come in and pour into our staff and he's poured into my life. And I've had the honor of speaking at his amazing church and learned so much. But you know what? You're in for a blessing. Fasten your seatbelt. Would you put your hands together and give a warm, warm welcome to Pastor Chris Hodges. Very honestly, one of the greatest honors of my life, I, um, I tell pastors that I, I go to church on Mondays. And so I work all day Sunday like your pastor does, but on, on Monday, I, um, I get my sweatpants on and my t-shirt and I go down to my office and I start browsing through online churches, uh, church experiences. And this is the honest to God truth. I wouldn't say this just because I'm standing here. Free Chapel is the first place that I go to because your pastor's messages, they, they, they just feed me so much. And to be standing in the place that has stood me up for so many times on, on many, many Mondays, days where I was, I was down or going through something and hearing the Word of God. I just can't tell you what that means to me right now. I love, love, love your pastors. Uh, J Jensen and Sharice have become, yeah, they're dear friends. And I can only imagine that people kind of wonder, you kind of wonder, you know, what are, they, what, are, what are pastors really like? You know, if you could kind of go in the back room and talk to them. Notice the assumption here is that you will never be able to talk to these people in person. But if you could, you'd think they're great. The truth is, if you went to a real church, you would be talking to a real pastor. They are the same exact people full of love and integrity and genuineness. You say, what do y'all talk about? Hey, we talk 99% of the time. He wants to talk about y'all. I mean, he just, he loves the church. I think we ought to put our hands together and just thank God. Come on, for great pastors. Come on, you're really blessed. You're worshiping out of choice. 
You could have stayed home. You could have went out on the lake. But here you are sitting in church, singing, shouting, clapping, praising. And God says, you chose me today. And I'm going to bless you all week long because you chose me. He said, as long as I have breath in my body, Pastor Jensen Franklin will never be forgotten. He said he would do anything he could do to serve you, to honor you, to give to you, to your family. We love you. You are a general. I know half of us put those gray hairs there. Come on. This is a man of prayer. This is a man of God. Thank you so much, Rick. Keep that heaven open. Come on, put your hands together and welcome the man of God. Welcome the preacher, Pastor Jensen Franklin. He's our friend. He's a kingdom of God's man. Wow. Praise the Lord. But I'm honored. I'm honored to be back at this great church and to be back at this great conference. And I love and appreciate your pastors. Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Paula are remarkable, remarkable, remarkable leaders. I think I'm at one of my favorite churches in the entire world with some of the greatest people ever. And I say that because, um, well, first off, turn around, hug somebody, squeeze them so tight till they can barely breathe and just say, I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, thank you so much, Courtney. It is such a blessing to be with you. I love the Franklin family. I really have the deepest respect. You know, I've known Pastor Jensen, I think, since I was about 19 years old, and Sharice, and um, I know none of y'all saw that facial mask that he got, and, uh, but um, I'm so grateful for their friendship, but, but for their stance, for their family, for their life, for their integrity, and though they're on vacation coming back, will you give honor to whom honors you, and will you let Pastor Jensen and Sharice know we love them, seriously. I mean, he is such a statesman for the body of Christ. Well, I'm excited. I've got a word for you. I think we'll encourage you. This was the most difficult encourage you. This was the most difficult thing I've ever done to write something greater. It was also the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Um, it took me nine years to write, uh, literally two years of writing. Before you're seated, before you're seated, it is a love fest indeed. It is a love fest indeed. I absolutely love your pastors. And I don't say that rhetorically. It's I am the president of the Jensen Franklin fan club. Warning, if you thought the other people were laying it on a little bit too thick with the compliments to Jensen Franklin, it's going to get a lot worse. You may need to uh, use a barf bag. I really do love your pastor. We do a lot of things uh, outside the confines of, of what we do here at Free Chapel, but within our respective ministries and even in the past couple of years, God has brought us even more together. You happen to have the best pastor on the planet. Give it up for Pastor Jensen and Pastor Sharice. Best pastors, without a doubt, on the planet. Best pastors. Best pastors. I, I told my wife recently about this like mutual love thing we have with Pastor Jensen and I. It got, it, she kind of looked at me kind of awkward. And I said, honey, it's holy, but uh, I was thinking about tattooing his name on my, it would be awkward, but it's just different. It's just different. Yeah, yeah. You, you, listen, y'all may be seated. You may be seated. I'm honored to be with you again. Absolutely love Free Chapel. Make sure you buy his books when you go out into the lobby after this is done. This is how you make tens of thousands of dollars. Like people weekend. in Amway. Yes, it's just like Amway. Right. Only it's got a little bit more of a Christian veneer. Yeah. But it's still just a veneer. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let's keep going. And look to your right, and I want you to realize that you're looking at a church full of miracles in this room right now. Because there are people who have been through problems. There are people who have been through sicknesses. There are people who've been, who have who've buried kids. There are people who've lost loved ones. There are people who have been wounded. They have been hurt. They have been devastated. But they're still here. They're still worshiping. They're still praising. They're still shouting. They're still believing. They're still holding on. And if you've been wounded and you're... So this is the tactic. The, Let's hear the content of what he's saying right mm -hmm. now is really anything motivational. He could say anything and he's building it up. He's getting louder and faster. 
and everyone knows that this is the time when you clap mm -hmm. because that's what they do every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Is he saying anything with substance? Well, the only reason or the only way you would know that for sure is to actually listen to the words and, and take away all the emotion and the, that's a good the point. building up. Mm -hmm. And actually his point here is really interesting because it doesn't go along with what he started with. Uh, the mortal wound that he, he talked about. Had? Well, yes, that, and also how the devil is trying to do all these things to you. Yeah. And he's saying everyone in this room has had bad things happen to them, and yet they're still hanging in there. Which is true. That's, right. that's how life is. For, even if you're not a Christian, you get through. Right. You have kids that die. You know, bad things happen to everybody. And he's saying that's a miracle. You know, and we do give God credit when we get through tough times. Mm -hmm. So his point is really. I don't know what it is. I don't either. But he's making everybody clap. Yeah. <laughs> so Still here, I want you to give God a great praise. Yeah, come on, just take a moment and say, I have been wounded, I have been hurt, but I am still alive and I'm still here and I'm still believing. I'm still believing. Believing in what? Believing for what? This is an applause line. Yeah, it is. You know, every so often, you, you can kind of time it. You know, he's, been, he's gone for a while now. There's got to be an applause let's, line let's coming up. Yeah. The devil can huff and he can puff, but he cannot blow your house down. Greater is he that is in us than he, he that is, is in, in the world. world. Good pauses there, Jensen. The wounds of life that the enemy Satan sins are sent for one purpose to destroy you, to inflict you with a deadly wound that kills your soul, that kills your worship, that kills your joy, that kills your dream, that kills your marriage, that kills your family. Peter was warned by Jesus, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you, to wound you with a deadly wound. But I have prayed for you. Look at the reference. It just says Luke 22. It just says Luke 22. Hey, it's too much work for the, the AV guy to actually find which verse he's referring to. Yep. We'll just let the expert on stage say whatever the Bible says. We don't need to actually look it up or check him. We trust him blindly. It was out, obviously, let's see, after the Lord's Supper... It it's, would be uh, verse 31. 31. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read it from the ESV. Okay. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned, and when you have turned again. Returned. Mine says turned. It says, and when you have returned to me again, to Turn. me, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And he said to them. I, I mean, this is a this story is great, but he's not even referring to no, any of the story. None of it. He just says that. Listen to what he said. Yeah, let's, let's, he, he, why did he use this again? Because he says we want to hear it. Satan wants to uh, sift you, kill you, yeah, to sift you, to wound you. Um. He wants to sift you like wheat. Where's the part where it says he wants to wound you? Doesn't. It's not in there. He just stuck it there because it goes along with his... What he's saying. His little Narrative. Topic, his narrative, mm -hmm. yep. With a deadly wound. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. He was saying, in other words, Peter the devil wants to do everything he can to keep the microphone out of your hand on the day of Pentecost. And so he's going to wound you, and when, not if, when you are converted or healed of that wound, go find your brothers and strengthen them. When you are healed of your deadly wound and your deadly attack, it's going to open up the opportunity for you to help somebody else. <laughs> It doesn't say that. Nope. It doesn't say that at all. Jesus gets all over him because he says, you're going to deny me. Peter says, oh, I'm, I'm with you. 
And it, this, he totally skipped the part where Jesus scolds him very harshly mm -hmm. and says, you are about to deny me, even though you don't think so. Right. I'm just looking at some notes here. So he so turned this, pa he, he read none of it. And he read a lot into it. He read into that it. That wasn't it. He read what he, he wanted it to say. added to scripture. He added to scripture. Which Paul says in Galatians. in Galatians, that would be another gospel. Another gospel, yes. let him be accursed. Let him be and cursed. let me say that again. Yes. <laughs> he, he, he quotes that twice. Prayer still makes the difference. Jesus said, I'm praying for you that the wound that the enemy is going to hit you with, Peter, does not destroy your faith. Okay, so if you're watching our video and you've never maybe seen us before and you think we're too snarky or whatever. Right. I'm really glad you got this far into the video. Yes. And we did not set a timer. Oh, I'll keep it going. Yeah, so I don't know how long this is going to be. But this is a point where you, as a genuine Christian, need to say, I'm leaving and I'm never coming back. This man is so utterly disqualified. I'm embarrassed that I was ever here. Or and, and I want to say, go in peace. Right. Because, yeah, this is what the Holy Spirit does. When the yes. Holy Spirit's really working in your life. Yes. It tells you to leave. They're red flags. You read, something's wrong. I, th and I had a feeling. And maybe that's what you've been thinking right along. Yes. Or you're watching this thinking all of a sudden it's like, wow. Yeah. This my man pastor is, is like this. this, this I guy, never saw this exactly. before. Exactly. And this is not uh, just Isolated. This, yeah, exactly. This mm -hmm. guy is an example that many are following. Right. He just happens to be the more famous of the of the many, many thousands of pastors who do this. Because a lot of the smaller people, because everybody hates denominations, right. they hate seminaries, they don't want to have any of that head knowledge, they just listen to guys like this and just copy them. So they, no one's actually studying like they should. Yeah, and Paul, which actually goes against scripture with Paul telling Timothy to guard your doctrine carefully. Yes. Healing will come. Restoration will come. I want to say that again because it felt so good. Healing will come. Applause line. If you won't give up. What kind of healing? This is a generic feel so, good So saying. what if you're saying, oh, what that, I knew it because I've been praying because I've, you know, not been talking to my mother or we've had um, a disagreement and I have not been with my, you know, father or sister or some other issue yeah. that might be physical mm -hmm. like oh i've been waiting for the healing for my leg well now this must be for me because i specifically last night prayed that god would give me a sign yeah yeah to show me that i was right and continually believing. and i just found him on the youtubes yeah yeah it's scary what he's doing because he's giving people a, a sort of false hope and we're not saying that god doesn't ever heal we're just saying that we don't know god's will and we should never pretend to know god's will and a quote-unquote pastor should never stand in authority of the shepherd and tell people some things that are very ambiguous mm -hmm. to give false hope. Exactly. But there is an enemy who wants the wounds of life to destroy you. Isaiah 53 puts it this way. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. I got the verse. Two key words. Yeah, he he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded, he was bruised for us, not for himself. Now we are the body of Christ. He, he was wounded for us, not for himself. It's true, but who gets wounded for themselves? That's kind of a weird, he's trying to. Maybe, maybe he's saying that he didn't deserve it. The wounds that he was inflicted upon him was not maybe, deserved. Yeah. Could it be that your wound or your attack is not really for you or about you? Could it be that you might be going through hell today so that through your wounds, somebody else can be healed tomorrow? That's why he said what he said. Yeah. Jesus was wounded for us. Therefore, when we get wounded, it's for other people. Just like Jesus. Yeah. We aren't Jesus. He, he's just reading stuff into the <sighs> passages as much as he needs now, to now, granted, to make the points that he wants to make. There are things that we go through we can turn around and help others Absolutely. with. Absolutely. Like what we're yeah. doing here. Yeah, we, we've we've done all the dumb church stuff that and everybody can do. And we've gone through this and we've believed yeah. it and we've gone through hurt and all that stuff. So he's not making a terrible point in, in, with that, but he's just misusing the passage right. to make the point that he wants to make. Right. Tomorrow. Webster defines a wound as being an injury to the body and like we don't know what a wound is. 
This is another way that um, guys who are disqualified, they look up a word in the dictionary and then they somehow exegete, take the meaning from the dictionary to try to make a spiritual application. Many of you in this room have been wounded by a divorce, wounded by a bankruptcy, wounded by a, a layoff. Maybe your wound was overcoming an unfaithful spouse. Maybe it's an untimely death of a son, a daughter, a husband, or a wife. Maybe the wound is only seeing your kids every other weekend or not at all. Maybe your wound is a spouse that admits he's no longer in love with you. So why do you think he's giving all these examples? Every time he gives all these examples of various difficulties in life. Well, what do you think? Well, he's trying to relate to everybody so that he, he thinks this way I can make this message apply to everybody. Almost like the net is now bigger. I can catch more fish with this story. Yeah, and whether his intentions are good or if he's just kind of going through the thing that he always does right. to get the results he always gets, um, it's almost like the Bible's good, but unless I tell people real examples that they can relate to, there's no way the Bible is really relatable and applicable. Mm -hmm. I think there's this sense that I gotta help the Bible. Mm -hmm. I've gotta make this story apply to people by making sure that I use all these examples. Instead of, by his wounds we were healed. I mean, it's that's- It's really about us being healed from the sin problem. It's what Jesus died on the cross for is us. It's about salvation. Right. And he's taking something so beautiful as, as salvation and he's cheapening it yeah, that's to, true. to us. And it's like, no, we just had this amazing, you know, golden nugget given to us of what God has given to us. And he's cheapening or, or making it so less by making it be lesser than what it really is supposed to be, I guess. And, and the perspective he keeps changing everything into is this is about you and your problems your specific problems, the problems that a lot of people honestly do go to oh, church. Of course. They're saying, okay, I'll go to your church, but how are you going to help me with my divorce? Or right? my kids. How are you going to help me with my kids? How right. are you going to help me with my bad finances? Right. Come on, what do you got? And that's when guys like this go, oh, I'll, I'll give you something. It won't be from the Bible, but I'll pretend it is, and I'll, I'll give I'll it to you. I'll take a scripture from the Bible yeah. and make it, make it fit what you want it to sound and I'll, like, and I'll tickling make it, ears Exactly, mm -hmm. and I'll make it sound like I'm gonna, I got the cure for how God's going to help you with whatever your problem is, divorce, Bad relationships. Indian elixir. <laughs> it's the Indian elixir, <laughs> yes. Far more than that. It is a tonic, an elixir, to purge the body and lift the spirits, to put a light in the eye and a spring in the step. Aunt B. <laughs> yeah, Mayberry. A lilt in the voice and hope in the human heart. Breathes there a man with soul so dead he can say he is not interested. One of our favorite shows. Anyway. Umbrella. <laughs> Good show. Them devils. Yeah. <laughs> maybe your wound is being betrayed by a close friend or relative. Maybe, maybe your wound is an addiction to alcohol or drugs or pornography. Maybe there's trouble with your kids. Maybe there's violence in your life. Okay, so these examples aren't all wounds. You notice what he just did? Huh. If you have a problem he with, jumped, with, I know. with pornography. Yeah, that's not a wound. That's not a wound. That's, that's called a, sin. a sin. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of people with that issue. Right. And it's a really serious issue. And it's okay that he brought it up. Yeah. But he's he's, he's, he's kind of making it sound like He's this, delegating it under a topic or, or a headline. He's miscategorizing That's it. it. Yeah. Miscategorizing. Most of these guys don't really talk about sin in a way that's actually helpful. Right. Because it always is the devil that's the problem. Yeah. He already started with that premise. That's right. The devil is trying to get you. You need to step up to the plate you, and say, because of my sinful yes. flesh, I chose to do this and yes. I chose not to listen to God or read his word and know what his will is and ask for help from the Holy Spirit to, you know, not participate in whatever it is. Yeah. Life, we have wounds that seem like they cannot be healed. Deadly deadly wounds. Now I want you to listen to me. Notice what happened in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. When the deadly wound, <laughs> wound was healed, verse 3 says, and all the people wondered. In the King James it says, they wondered. And then in verse 4 it says, they worshiped. You, you didn't think this could get worse. Right. Here we go. It's getting worse. This, it's getting worse. I forgot about this part. Yeah, me too. It's been a while since we've watched the whole thing this, together. Did you even watch the whole thing with me? <laughs> Probably not. 
She never watches the whole. Wait, we, you, you've only done that like. Two I don't times. like stomach aches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't blame you. Uh, let's. And uh, remember why we even started the show. Because I, um, he, he, I wanted to get your reaction without having seen it. He wanted to have a reaction video. Yes. Yeah. And I didn't even know what one was, and, and so I, I like keeping it that way at times. Yes. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea. I'm starting at verse one of chapter thirteen. With ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems or crowns on its, on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads, and the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power, and his throne, and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? Let's see what he does with that. And then in verse 5, it says, A mouth was given to speak, so they witnessed. And in verse 7, it says that they went to war. After the healing, after the overcoming of the wound, notice the progression. The wonder came back. The awe. And then the worship. And then the witness, and then the war. Uh, Explain what just happened. Well, he didn't read the passage. He just picked out a few verses, and he made it apply to us as Christians and how we're going to have victory in life. But we have to go to war. Well, but war actually means going out there and fighting the good fight. I mean, what's the purpose of having the Bible at all? Right. We don't need this. No, it's just a prop. It is a prop. It's a total prop. Because I'm interpreting it the way I, f I feel. I feel, right? Revivalism? I, I mean, this is, I think he probably believes that God helps him to make stuff up that's actually from God. I feel. Yeah, it's totally. I feel. Or. No normal human being. Right. With any level of intelligence, even somebody who doesn't have intelligence would read this and go, you know, I think this is about us getting yeah. over our problems and having a successful. And not really about the Antichrist. No, it's not about the Antichrist, no. even though it's about the Antichrist. Antichrist and the end times <laughs> yeah. and what Jesus the, wanted us to know about the end, and he had John write this. And it's about these, the beast is blaspheming against God. Right. How does that apply? It doesn't. Right. It, he's making it, he's ignoring whatever part of it he wants to ignore, and he's applying whatever part he wants to apply. Do you think somebody like this, who's been teaching for as long as he has, I hate to say teaching, but that's what he calls it. Yeah. You know, comfortable in his skin, comfortable in exactly doing that, taking I, whatever Bible passage yeah. it is. How do you get that comfortable? Right. What, what allows you to get on stage in front of all and, these people and think that you're doing something that's good? It's frightening. It's absolutely frightening. Right. It's wrong. If I was, honestly, if I wasn't sure if I believed in God or not. Yeah. One of the, I think, most compelling reasons why I think the Bible and Christianity is actually something to be taken seriously mm -hmm. is because Christianity takes a very high view of moral issues, mm -hmm. of the of the reality right. of good and evil. What's right and wrong. It doesn't say, you know, we're not really sure what's right or wrong, so just go out it's there not, and, and be nice. It's not subjective. It's, it's very harsh against evil. Right. And it's also very clear that evil is inside the church. Right. Because the it's warnings true. all over the New Testament don't say, you know, those bad people out drinking in bars are the are the bad people, and you got to stay away from those people. It doesn't say that. No. Those people are already not Christians. Right. They're not the problem. The problem is the false teaching inside the church. The problem is actually in your own heart. Your human heart has a tendency to think it knows everything and to think it's better than everybody else. Right. And when you're on stage and you have an ego and you have everybody just saying, you're great, you're wonderful. And cheering you on. And cheering you on. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's when the worst evil comes out of a person. And especially somebody who's disqualified like he is, who really probably thinks he's hearing from God when he's just making up nonsense. It's not even nonsense. It's actual blasphemy. Right. And it reminds me of... He can't even pronounce blasphemy. Blasphemies. 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 Blas How do you say it? Blasphemies. Blasphemies? Something like that. Anyway. anyway, so I think about people with a seared conscience. Yes. That's when I this look at an somebody example. like... Right. This, this should shock everybody who's a Christian. It shocked us you should completely. Be, yeah, you should be in shock. And, and that tens of thousands of people follow him and think that this is God's word he's preaching. And all the people he associates with, all the big pastors, they yeah. all approve of him. They all call him great. 
Do they actually check what he teaches before they claim that he's great? Maybe they teach the same things he does. None of these people check each other. Right. Like that, that celebrity super pastor video I yeah. made. You've got Stephen Furtick talking about how uh, Carl Lentz is probably the most Christ-like person I know. And then what happened? As he was sleeping with a woman for months on end, and he didn't tell this woman that he was a pastor. She kept saying, what do you do for a living? And he wouldn't answer her. That's not a Christ-like person, that's no. an anti-Christ-like person. Right. Stephen Furtick called him Christ-like because he's just propping them up. They prop each other up. It's, right. a, it's, a, it's a sort of mafia where they're all at the top, they're all backing each other up. You know, I got your back. If you go out there and say something bad, I'll, I'll claim that it was a genuine mistake and how dare those little people out there criticize you. Oh my gosh. And we're the little people. Right. The 99.9% the .9 of the church, we're all little people. But we've got God's word. That's right. And so, thank God we have God's word. And we're all equal. That's right. Because of God's word. Mm -hmm. Even a pastor is just like the rest of us. He's just been placed in a in a station or an office mm -hmm. for a time, and he's actually, in a way, he's lower because he's the servant for everybody else. Right. And if your pastor doesn't act like a servant, he acts more like a dictator. And you can't have time with him because he's yes. too busy. Yeah. Do you think you can actually go and talk to this guy in Probably person? Probably not. No. And if you did, it would be like you'd have to have a three-month appointment. Because we've talked to people in these big churches, yeah, and that's have. what they've told us. You get 20 minutes every three months. <laughs> and then he says, I'll look into it. And then he, never, he, he doesn't care. People go into a church like this, and they leave a church like this every week. Right. And there's nobody keeping track. So... You see, this is what the enemy wants to do. Let's, let's back it up. And when you understand that... <laughs> let's back, back it up. Back it up. <laughs> to where? He's seen our show before. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot wage successful war without a strong witness. And you can't have a strong witness without true personal worship going on in your life. And you'll never have worship without wonder and awe of God. And the danger that, that, that you can never get to that place. Uh, I just, I got to make another whole video just on this excerpt. He probably will. I, I... You're at a loss for words I'm right at now. a loss for words. Right. I mean, he's going on and on about this passage about the beast and the Antichrist, and he's applying it to us. I mean, he thought through this. He's got notes. He has an outline. Yeah. This didn't just come to him right now, and he's yeah. not later on saying, God, I can't believe I said that. I'm so sorry. It's so wrong on so many levels. It's like, where do you begin? I know. You yeah. could you could, you could could do like a, a, a three-month study on the levels of <laughs> wrongitude. <laughs> the wrongness of this yes. sermon. Yes of warring against the enemy and defeating him. All you are the enemy. Yeah. You're not warring against him. Right. You're taking his side. Right. All is connected to the wound not being healed. Because when you have wounds that are not healed, you begin to lose the wonder of God. You begin <laughs> to lose the worship of God. No, if you have wounds that don't get healed, you're like the Apostle Paul. Right who had a thorn in his side that God specifically said, I'm leaving it there. And it's for your it's for your benefit that I keep you wounded. Right. Let's not bring that up. Let's not bring that up. Because we're talking about the Antichrist and how he is so uh, <laughs> similar to us. He's such a good example. Yeah, he's such a good example of, of you know how we're wounded and then what happens next and the praise. and. Okay, so some of you think we laugh too much. <sighs> yeah, right. This is really bad. This is so bad that, yeah, we do laugh, and, and it's because we want to enjoy ourselves as we wade through the absolute sewage of a man like this. It is sewage. It really is. Because otherwise, this would, nobody would watch this. No, I, I wouldn't watch this. I wouldn't either. This is too dark. It's really dark. And you know what? A lot of discernment video-type shows, they start out with the flames, and they get the scary music, yeah. and it's just so creepy. It's like, okay, okay, okay. We get it. It doesn't really help. Right. It makes Christians look like we're practically like, you know, witches, you know, mixing a brew in our basement. We're talking about evil so much. Yeah. So we like to lighten it up. We like to have some fun. But yeah, this is, this is hard to laugh at at this point. Yeah. No, it's. It, right. We're 11, almost 12 minutes. Actually, there was a commercial. So I think he's only done about 10 minutes of preaching at the most. So what do you want to do? <sighs> I mean, how does he even wind it up? He just goes or, on or about. Or I should say like. Let's, sew it up let's or keep, end it up. Yeah, well, he basically tries to make some, some points about how you can have a healing in your life. 
God. You begin to lose your witness of God. And then you cannot fight spiritually and win the war that you're in because you no longer are in a place of advantage. But the enemy has has come and he has got a, a bitter root down inside of you that poisons your spirit through that wound. The reason that there's no wonder is because there's still deadly wounds. I'm saying to you that wounded people cannot truly worship. We're never going to get through this. I, we're all wounded. Right. Every single one of us. This is all. And again, the apostle, the apostle Paul, do you think we're too harsh? Do you really think we're too harsh? Because what would the apostle Paul say to this man? I, I'm, I'm serious. He would run down the, the platform or the, and he would jump on stage and he would probably start screaming at the audience that this is the worst false teacher yes. he's ever heard. Right. And I wouldn't be surprised if he would physically push him off the stage. Mm -hmm. That's, this is so far from Christianity. Mm -hmm. Everything he says is, is absolutely wrong. Everything. Right. Everything. I mean, except for maybe he said that Jesus is Lord at some point. He said something about Jesus being and Lord. And you know what's interesting is Jesus says that in the last day, people will come to me. I, Lord, I... Lord, Lord. Yeah, I, don't you know me? I, I did all these things in your name. I did miracles. I He, he does do stuff in people. Jesus' name, but right. he's, he's, he's actually saying the opposite of what the Bible teaches right. in the name of Jesus. You know, in our early time of, of being married and when we would hear people possibly that were false teachers but not really understanding because we weren't we didn't you know we didn't do our our due diligence reading and understanding scripture and analyzing it not nearly enough not nearly enough but i remember thinking <clears throat> well it's not the same but they used the name jesus right to me you know back then and that was probably 20 years ago i think if anyone used the name jesus well then they must right. be fine if they asked in jesus name well then they're a brother and sister in christ no they're not this and is I, this is one of those things that it's really <laughs> tough because, yeah, there are people who are Christians and we absolutely see them as brothers and sisters in Christ, right. and they're not the same as us about certain doctrinal sure. things. Uh, but when we look at this, I'm talking about this yes. man. Yes. So there's some people, and, and the reason I want to make this point is some yeah. people think, why don't you s speak out against, you know, whatever, whatever it is. pick whatever it is. Yeah. Like for instance, we're not Calvinists. Right. So people say, well, why don't you speak out against Calvinism? Because Frankly, the Calvinists are doing so much good in the world of the church, speaking out against false teaching. We partner with them. We don't speak out against them. If somebody wants to know the they differences... They know, who Jesus, they know yes. who Jesus is. This guy obviously doesn't. And the Calvinist would know how to, to speak against this because they are trained. They love the scriptures. Yeah. And they really take it seriously. And so we partner with Calvinists, even though there's some areas where we disagree, because frankly, I think that's the smart thing to do. I would partner with any Bible-believing Christian against this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there are areas where we say this is an absolute false teacher. This a is heresy. Mm -hmm. This is a train wreck. This is unbelievably dangerous. This is blasphemous. Right. And then there's a whole different category where there's all these secondary issues, you know, where, yeah, we have doctrinal differences. And that's something I'm very interested in. I like to discuss those things. But that's not what we do with these shows. No. We're trying to hit the big targets. Yeah. Because there's such a train wreck out there. These are these are primary problems. Primary problems, and if we if we can nail those, right. then we can hopefully lead you guys down the road to to find your way to a true Bible believing yes. church. <laughs> and I should point out, and I haven't done this with the last video or two, that we do have a completely separate Patreon series of videos That's where right. we do go into more of those theological issues. Yes, we do. Actually, he does. And yeah, and we're I on a, listen. <laughs> and we're on AGTV with a bunch of other people who yes. teach much more detailed stuff. Yes, and it's really good. It's really good stuff. And of course, our friend Chris Roseborough on Fighting for the Faith. Yes. He's the best Bible teacher on the entire internet, in my opinion. And if you want to know more about what does the Bible really teach, please listen to his his shows. They're, yeah. I can't compete with him. I don't even want to try because he's a Bible expert at a level I'll never achieve because that's what he does for a living. We're just lay people who are right. you know, trying to do our best as, as just kind of regular Christians. So there are resources for you to get to kind of get into those secondary yeah. issues. Yeah. Frankly, a lot of people don't really want to go there. No. They're like, oh, I don't care if you're a Methodist or Lutheran or... 
Calvinist or what it's, it doesn't make any difference actually it does make a difference mm -hmm. and that's an important discussion but that's not what we, what we do with this show and a lot of the other things so yeah, this I, show is to hit the primary the primary targets right. the really bad stuff who are also the really really popular stuff right let's keep going a little bit more okay hurting people hurt people wounded people live in the past okay <laughs> there are no Bible passages for what he's saying and there is a little bit of truth to this. If you haven't gotten over it hurts and you're super bitter and you don't really have that kind of Christian faith that causes you to see, yeah, yeah, I am really harsh on everybody else. I am constantly going back to the things that um, people did to me. And, you know, and gosh, no wonder why I don't have any friends. Yeah. No wonder why I'm always so mad. You know, and you have to go back to it's, it's important to deal with issues in the past for sure. And maybe you need counseling. We're not against that. No, not at all. But ultimately, you got to deal with the fact that as a Christian, really the key issue is, what about you? What about your sin? Mm -hmm. What about your selfishness? What about your self-righteousness? What about the fact that you're constantly lashing out at people and stuff? You know, going back to the past is maybe not the entire answer to the problem. Maybe the, the real problem right. is you need to confess that you're actually a big part of what's wrong with you. It's Good you. Point. It's your sinful nature. We all have a sinful nature still as Christians. And he's not mentioning that. He's going to kind of go back to, you got to get over these wounds that the devil did to you. Mm -hmm. And maybe he'll bring it up a little bit, but... I can go get the dog. Okay. And God wants to reintroduce the wonder. God wants to reintroduce the worship. God no, what God wants to do is he wants to remind you of the gospel message. That's what he's not bringing up. The gospel message is what we need to hear every week. If you watch our church services at our church, our pastor does that every single week. He, he literally would never do a sermon without it being a gospel-centered sermon. Oh, she's right here. <laughs> so he's kind of saying something sort of good, but he actually pulled the meaning of those out of the passage, which is about the beast. So uh, it's true that we need to be reminded of what God has done for us, but he's not doing it in a very good way. God wants to reintroduce the witness. And re you know what? God would introduce what's important about Christianity if you would just read the Bible itself right. and go back to those things. But you're not doing that. You're trying to exegete a passage about the Antichrist and the beast, and you're trying to make that apply to the Christian life. He introduced the power of doing war against the enemy and see him defeated in our families. Okay, the enemy is already defeated. That's right. In case you didn't know, the devil... Uh, actually, if he has any power over you at all, it's because you think he has power over right. you. As a Christian, the devil can only do stuff like use dingbats like this man, mm -hmm. a buffoon, a clownish buffoon at that. He's not even a good buffoon to, to, to co completely confuse you about what it even means to be a Christian and what the Bible means. I mean, you, you've already seen he's misquoted the Bible every single time. Mm -hmm. Not a little bit, but like flipped it upside down. Mm -hmm. It's not God's will for that wound to kill you. It doesn't have to be a deadly wound. God can heal it. Okay, that... He's, uh, again, he's equating that to the Revelation passage. Yes. What does that actually mean, the deadly wound's going to kill you? I mean, I, don't know. I thought the gospel was about how Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we would have eternal life, so that even though we die, we live mm -hmm. eternally. Mm-hmm. So what's this thing about a wound? God wants to make sure the wound doesn't kill you. Mm. This is all like a, a mixture of language. Is it, is it allegory? Is mm -hmm. What category is he in? This man doesn't know what he's doing. That's really he even said wrong. that in the very beginning. He did. That's the one true <laughs> thing he said. I have no idea. <laughs> it's not God's will for you to lose sleep. It's not God. oh my applause goodness. line. God's will for you to let the wound that has been inflicted upon your life destroy your joy. We need the wonder. We need the worship. We need the we chocolate. We need the witness. And we need the war against the enemy to come back alive in our souls. And it will only happen when the wound has been healed. How do you get the wound healed? Well, number one, you realize you're not the only person to be wounded. That somebody just like you has gone through just as big of a situation and they were wounded and they are still victorious today. Jesus received deadly wounds at Calvary. But three days later, there was the resurrection. And when okay. he rose from the dead, the people wondered. 
And then the people worshipped. And then the people oh. witnessed. And then the war started for the... So he starts with the beast. And the pattern that was established by the beast is the same pattern that Jesus used. Okay, I gotta keep going. Souls of men. The deadly wound was healed and a church was birthed and a world was changed. And I Okay, so do you think he's gonna say that the same thing is gonna happen in our lives? Because I think that's where he's going. Probably. He just kind of, as an aside, mentions this thing about Jesus you know, getting raised from the dead and starting a church. And then Mom. war happened, just like it did in, you know, Revelation. Because, you know, equating war that's being committed by the Antichrist to us going out and having victorious Christian mm -hmm. lives is a good way to use the human language. Sure yeah. it is. Yeah. I'm saying to you today that that's why the devil tries to keep you offended, keep you hurt, keep you wounded, keep you mad, keep you upset. He knows if he can ever get you wounded he can make that wound if you don't get it healed become a so you know what i've noticed <clears throat> i'm an average person and listening to somebody like this in the past i would look at it and think i don't understand this or this but i get that you know so he's like hitting on people's um hot spots mm -hmm. or their where they can identify yeah. and say oh well, that's true i don't understand all this other stuff because you know I don't know scripture or I didn't, you know, I'm not the pastor, but he's telling me that my hurts, God wants to heal and not kill me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this must be true because, so he's really having it um, very broad, very broad so people can interpret the way they want to. Mm -hmm. So to them it's true, which is crazy. It's, mm -hmm. it's this, um, I don't know what, I, delusion. I, don't, I really don't know what word to use. Well, the thing is, if there's any actual good that comes from what he says here about mm -hmm. healing and getting over yeah. your past hurts and stuff, yeah. it's probably just the same thing you would get from any counselor. You know, or a motivational speaker. Or a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. You know, a life coach, mm -hmm. whatever it is. It doesn't really pertain to Jesus and the Bible mm -hmm. and Christianity and the church. It's just a message that he's taking from the outside secular non-Christian world and he's bringing it into the church and trying to, you know, twist the living daylights out right. of God's word to make it seem to, but let's let him go a little okay. bit longer because I think you're right. A deadly, deadly wound that begins to kill the joy in your life, in your family, in everything about you. He knows if you ever get healed of those deadly wounds, just like Jesus, lives will be altered because you survived your deadly wounds. Listen to this. Healing is a must. You have got to overcome this. You have got to get in the presence of the Lord until every hurt Every issue, every unforgiveness, every offense has been bathed and cleansed and washed in the blood of Jesus. And you come out saying, he makes me love everybody. Love everybody. Makes me love everybody. So don't leave that place of praying to God until all of that's done in your life. No pressure or anything. No just, pressure. Yeah, just go ahead and love everybody. And everybody is good enough for me. Isaiah 30 and verse 26. It so the blood of Jesus in this case isn't about removing the guilt of your sin. Right. It's about making you love everybody because you're, you're getting over your hurts. Good point. He's kind of mixing a category of what the actual atonement is is about it's yes it, it, it's sort of connected to pains and hurts and stuff right. but he's making it seem like that's what it is no and primarily what it what was it and is it it's it's about jesus paying the price that we deserve like i right. said earlier we exactly. deserve the the wrath of god you're staying in my lap this is an old testament <laughs> category that you see all over <laughs> she's hiding she's hiding anyway let's keep going is a powerful promise to people who have been wounded look at it he said, moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. 
And the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, or seven times brighter as the light of seven days. In that day that the Lord, when is this going to happen? When the Lord binds up the breach of His people, listen, and heals the stroke of their wounds. How much you want to bet he went into a concordance or Bible software and he just found the word wound? Yeah, and he went to see what it meant. Yeah. What other verses under there that he could bring out? Isaiah 30. I've got it. Go ahead. So, okay. So we're looking at Isaiah 30, verse 26. I'll start in 23. <clears throat> then he will give you rain so that you can sow seed in the ground. The bread from your land's harvest will be excellent and plentiful. And the day your livestock will graze in wide pastures. The oxen and the donkey... The donkeys that work the ground will eat the best feed. Winnowed with a shovel and winnowing fork on every lofty mountain, on every high hill, there will be streams flowing with water. It will be a day of terrible slaughter when towers fall. The light of the moon will be as bright as the sun, and the light of the sun will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven days. On the day when the Lord will bind up the wounds of his people and heal injuries he afflicted what okay what's context here why was isaiah saying this who is he talking to probably the children of israel uh -huh. what what time frame are we looking at when is this supposed to take place well it, this is my notes i'm using i just grabbed the esv study bible yeah um we didn't we didn't bring a bunch of study bibles although i think i have some right over there if i need to get them he will uh try Isaiah portrays the anticipated new order that will establish the Messianic kingdom. The details in this Old Testament portrayal suggest the glorious reality and fullness of the blessing. Some would see this as a poetic description of the glorious new Messianic order, something that will also something that will be so new and different that it can be described adequately only in poetic terms. Though others would hold that this is a literal description of the new Messianic order. Messianic order is referring to when the Messiah comes. So I guess he's saying this applies to us because it's the Messiah has come. And he's deciding that and, that's what it and is. And the stroke of their wounds. He found the word wound, basically. Yeah, and he said and this, he's going to just reminds me of the puzzle we were doing last night. This yeah. piece fits? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it not doesn't. Really. <laughs> it almost fits. He said your night will become like day, and your day will become seven times brighter when you let me heal your wounds. Oh God, nighttime will become daytime and... <laughs> He's gotta get better crying lessons from Todd White. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth, I am. I know I am. You believe me, don't you? <laughs> okay, good, you got that? <laughs> in your family and in your home, and daytime will become seven times. Daytime, daytime, nighttime. Nighttime. <laughs> nighttime, daytime, nighttime, daytime. <laughs> Brighter. I like that word seven because he said when the thief is found, he has to restore seven times. Whatever the enemy has taken, when you let God heal the wound, how do I know when I'm healed? When you can hear their name or that situation and you don't hate anymore and you don't get upset anymore, you are healed. And don't tell me God can't do it. And this is not an option. He said, if you don't, I won't. If you forgive, I will. If you release healing, I release healing. Is that important? I don't know what he's saying exactly anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so just a bunch of applause lines. You know what it reminds me of? You have a bucket and you pour all kinds of stuff in it <laughs> and it's all mixed together. You just and pull it's like, Yeah, it's like, what? That's oat? No, this this is barley? No, <laughs> wait a minute. What's this piece of candy doing at the bottom? It's like nothing is nothing is like equal to each other. And it's all in what he's saying. He's got this big pot of what he's saying. And it's all like... Yeah. Con I, I, oh. Has he actually said specifically how you get healed? No. Not at all. No. He's just promising that you're going to get healed and it's going to be great. Because that's what God wants. Because yeah. look at what when you Revelation let God, say. When you let God yeah. do it, it'll happen. But he said to those who will let me heal their wound. 
I will give you days that are seven times brighter. No. That's I'll talking give about you heaven. days that your nighttime new... will be like daytime. Daytime! Nighttime. <laughs> seven. The new messianic ruling, not because I Jesus forgave was somebody. Healed of his deadly wounds. Jesus was healed. So can you. But he was not healed of his scars. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the scar became a testimony of God's ability to heal. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was healed of his deadly wounds, but God did not take the scars away. We won't. <laughs> That's right. So, I don't the know. scars in your life? Maybe the scars that Jesus has would be a reminder of the great sacrifice on the cross he did for mankind. I don't know. That's for, just me. For all of eternity? And that he's the creator of but the universe. But no, he did that as an example to us so that when we have scars, we would be able to look at our scars and say, well, Jesus... Had scars, has too. Scar yeah, so we can use our scars. How you doing, Luz? How you doing? You doing good? Complete restoration where nobody knows we ever had an issue. We want such restoration that nobody knows that our perfect lives were not perfect. Well, that's kind of what he just said, though. He said earlier, you know, you got to get in the glory of God or the presence yeah, of God. Yeah, so until you can say, thank, I love everybody. Yeah, and you're 100% healed completely. Yeah. And now you can go and be do, and do now, something. And now he's someone. saying you shouldn't act like that. That you're perfect. Yeah, you should let people know have issues. that you've got. We Which want everybody to think that we have the picture-perfect family, the picture-perfect marriage, the picture-perfect life, and there has nothing because of my great faith ever come to my home. Scars are a testimony of God's ability to heal deadly wounds. Scars mean this is what I overcame. This is what, how bad it was. And this is how good God has healed me. And I'm not ashamed of my scars. And Jesus walked into the upper room after he rose from the dead. And he said, some people need to see my scars like Thomas or they'll never believe. He said in Zechariah that the Jews will not believe until they say, Who put these wounds in your hands? Then he will answer, I was wounded in the house of my friends. Oh yeah, I'm sure that applies exactly the way he wants it to. And the Jews will get the revelation, Jesus is the Messiah, the one that was crucified. Okay. In his own house is the Messiah, but they won't believe till they see his wounds. I'm saying to you, quit I, I have no idea again. What, what, what is, is he talking about? What's he? It's not really coherent to everything else. The, Although he keeps going back to wound. You take the emotion out? <clears throat> yeah. There's nothing. I mean, it's a, we keep using the word train, train wreck. wreck. We gotta come up with another term. I don't know. Train wreck's really good. It is good. Covering up your scars. They remind you of what you've been healed of. Wear them as a badge of honor. The scar proves how bad it was at one point. Hallelujah. I'd be a fool to walk around and act like I've never had marriage problems. Come on. I've never had family problems. I've never wanted to quit. But what you do is you look at the devil and you say, you see these scars? They're proof that you've tried your best with mortal Ramping wounds to Ramping destroy me, to wipe me out, Louder. to destroy my family. But no weapon go. formed against me us me could prosper, prosper because I serve a God who heals deadly wounds. Again, the foundation of that was but in the book like of perfect. Revelation yeah. with the beast. Quit being so prideful that you can't ever let anybody know. Doctors say two things are critical for wounds to heal. Two nuggets. Number one, they say leave a wound uncovered. It helps it stay dry and it helps it heal. It's I have to remember that. So if you want to get your wound healed, number one, stop covering it up. Mm. 
And then the second thing is they said bleeding helps clean the wound out. In other words, I would like anybody in our audience who's a uh, doctor or a nurse to give their Aromatic. thoughts on his... Uh... It only took a few seconds to find out that even his medical advice is wrong. Hi, welcome to Hot on Health. I'm Nurse Robbie. Today's episode of Myth vs. Fact wound healing. Here's something I hear at work all the time. People will injure themselves. They'll get a cut or a burn. If it's not serious enough to need stitches though, they'll generally just leave it themselves. They might put a dressing on it for a day or two and then just let it dry out in the air. After about a week, when it's not getting any better, maybe it's even getting a bit worse, they come into the practice, try to figure out what's going on and they say, I don't understand, I let it dry out. Because I hear this all the time, it's time to bust this myth. It is not better to let a wound dry out in the air, as is commonly believed. It used to be the recommendation to let a wound dry out, but now we know that that takes longer and actually can cause more damage. Wounds do require oxygen to heal, but they get everything they need from your blood. Also, reviews of the clinical literature have shown that while injuries treated with moist occlusive dressings can result in bacterial growth, they tend to have fewer incidents of infection compared to those treated with dry gauze. That's because they create a better barrier against pathogens like the dreaded MRSA and other nasty critters you don't want colonizing an open wound. Studies have also shown that skin heals faster with less scarring when it's kept moist. It helps it stay dry and it helps it heal. Studies have also shown that skin heals faster with less scarring when it's kept moist. It helps it stay dry and it helps it heal. Stop covering it up and let the blood flow. <laughs> They're clapping. Every time you come in here, just rip the band-aid off and say, well, come on, Jesus, let the blood flow. Change me, transform me, cleanse me, heal me. Get the bitterness out, get the anger out, get the hurt out, get the disappointment out, get the hopelessness out, get the depression out, get the fear out, get the suicide out. Heal my wounds, oh God. The church, we gotta quit playing God games. You can't shout over your wounds. But that's what you do. Exactly. Without shouting, this whole thing falls apart. Falls apart. You can't worship. You can't witness. You can't war. You'll lose the wonder of Christianity if you allow wounds and offenses and hurts and cuts to get you to the place that you become bitter. But I want to say to every person under the sound of my voice. Yeah, what is it, brother? I'm not denying that the wounds are real. <laughs> oh, listen to me today. Okay, we will. You may feel like you're at your wit's end. And yeah, you don't I am. Know what you're going to do. Listen you no to idea. you. <laughs> and you're wounded and you're hurt and you feel like giving up. But my heart is sensitive today because yeah. I've dealt with two suicides this week in this church that's not with funny. families that's not related funny. i that's sad. know those families I, I don't know what they feel but i can only imagine the wounds <clears throat> the wounds and i want to say to somebody today listening to me you won't find the answer in a bottle of alcohol. You won't find the answer in a peel. Today I am doing a chemical peel. You won't find the answer in a peel. You won't find the answer in cocaine. You won't find the answer in the arms of another lover. But come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. I can heal your wounds. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, Jesus. And by his stripes and wounds, we are healed. Well, I want to pray for you today. No, no. Can, can she howl? Yeah. She's kind of... You, you can get her going really good. Right? 
Bubba gets you going really good. We gotta get him going. I'll sound blame this message. You come in here, just rip the band off. And say, well, come on, what do you think about this heritage? Change me, change me, cleanse me, heal me. Get the bitterness out. Get the anger out. Get the hurt out. Get the disappointment out. Get the hopelessness out. Get the depression out. Get the fear out. Pretty bad, huh, Liz? Yeah. Oh, she's spoken once again. There she has spoken. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good girl. Yeah, I didn't know that was the end because there's that commercial at the end. So yeah. I think the whole thing is only about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes at the yeah. most. That was the worst 25 minutes. Yeah, that's so sad. I mean, uh. Okay, so let's end this. Oh, please. <laughs> Please. Thank you guys for watching. Thank and you. remember, if you're new, we do have a lot of other videos and a lot yes. of other people. So don't just type in thinking that we're sitting at the computer all day answering questions because we can't. Yeah. But um, there is a number of playlists that I have on the channel, not just our videos, but a lot of other people's videos that I think you'll find helpful. And we have recommended channels and they're yes. there because we really, really recommend them. And there is an entire website, the Messed Up Church website which I always put in the link to the description. Years of work that he's put into yep. it, writing papers on yep. all of these topics yep. with scripture and... Lots of links to other people, other videos, yes. other articles, lots of resources that I, yep. I, I just know will be helpful, but you gotta do your own homework. You need to take responsibility for your own spiritual life. Yep. And that's what we all need to do as Christians. We do. So we thank you so much for your support yes. and for your wonderful... <laughs> thank you so much for your support. <laughs> and for your... It means so much to us. And for... i got to slick back my hair next time. <laughs> <clears throat> and for your encouraging words. Yeah. And, your, and support in verbally telling us what you think and, and how you feel. And um, we really appreciate that. Thank you. God bless you guys. you got to get the... Until we get meet the again. Sad, you got to get the sad face. Look at that, look at that face. Lucy... You just Lucy know says, he's telling you the truth. <laughs> Lucy says goodbye. Okay. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Bye -bye.